uh, within a bracket uh, because uh, I wanted to, co to cover the basic aspects of uh, diagnosis of neonatal sepsis too because they come in handy uh, for a clinician. So the objectives uh, for, this to for today's presentation, I have tried to um, you know, put them in the form of certain questions which the clinicians would uh, usually ask while diagnosing uh, neonatal sepsis. So they are, can't I re uh, rely on clinical diagnosis alone? Do I need to have a specific diagnostic methods? The second question or uh, the problem that they usually face is, uh, we send blood cultures, but blood cultures are often reported sterile. What do, you, what do we do in such scenario? Uh, how can we rely on sepsis screen? Do we need to send them for all cases of uh, neonatal sepsis? Is CRP useful? What about procalcitonin? Is it better than CRP? What about molecular diagnostic methods? And in a resource limited setting, such as in India, which would be the best way to go? So uh, I would try to answer each one of these questions. So the first point is, can't we diagnose sepsis clinically? Can't we rely on our clinical diagnostic skills? So when we think about uh, sepsis, it has a varied presentation. And the presentation is often very non-specific. It can vary um, um, with just, uh, it can present with temperature instability, not always fever. The mother may just complain that the baby is not doing well or appearing well, uh, there is poor feeding, or there can be symptoms specific to a particular organ system. For example, symptoms related to gastrointestinal tract, tachypnea, um, cardiovascular system, neurological problems like lethargy, irritability, seizures, uh, etc. So because the presentation is so non-specific and it can overlap with other non-infectious diagnosis, hence the dilemma. So that is why we um, um, cannot rely on um, um, clinical um, findings alone. So but still when we think about sepsis, uh, clinical diagnosis is very, very important. So how do we use the um, clinical experience or clinical findings into practice? So this, uh, they have tried to, this particular group have tried to objectify clinical signs and put them to practice. So they have tried to stratify newborns into babies who are clinically well, those who have equivocal findings, and those who present with clinical illness. So in normal appearing babies, they don't have any physiological abnormalities. When has equivocal signs, signs. <laughs> there's some echo, please mute yourself. So when done it. Um, yes, please carry on, please. In equivocal findings, there were physiological abnormalities that were persistent. So um, it can be tachycardia, tachypnea, temperature instability, or respiratory distress, which did not require any oxygen therapy. And if lasted uh, for more than four hours, even one sign was taken as significant, two or more signs which lasted for more than two hours. Clinically um, um, ill infants were defined as those babies who required any non-invasive respiratory support or mechanical ventilation, if they required oxygen for more than two hours to maintain saturation, those babies who presented with shock uh, requiring inotropes or neurological signs like asphyxia or encephalopathy or those who had required resuscitation at birth. So they had tried to stratify infants at presentation and use this information in deciding whether babies need to be evaluated for sepsis or not. So this is how they did. They developed a cal calculator. This is for early onset sepsis evaluation. They again objectified certain findings from the maternal history. So instead of saying whether mother had some risk factor or not, like preterm labor or something, what they looked at was two objective findings in the mother. They are maternal temperature. The exact temperature was recorded and the duration of rupture of membranes was recorded. So this particular calculator was specific for babies who were late preterm and term. And they had also put in the baseline risk or the incidence of early onset sepsis in that particular unit. They also factored in maternal GBS status and whether the mother had received any antibiotics for intrapartum antibiotics for the same. And they combined this with the baby status, whether the baby was clinically well, equivocal, or symptomatic. 
So when these were combined together, they could get a risk factor. What would be the risk in this particular berry? So for example, I have put in four out of a uh, thousand. So this is the maximum that this calculator would allow. And I had put in a gestational age of 36, maternal fever and ruptured membrane for 24 hours. So I get a risk factor for um, the incidence to be 23. And uh, so in all the, even if the baby is well in this particular scenario, they had advised empirical antibiotics and uh, sent cultures. So the question is, is it suitable for our setting? Uh, so this is the same. What they had said is when they had evaluated six lakh, six lakh babies, 85% would escape without any antibiotics. In those babies, the risk of infection was very less. And in certain other babies up to 11%, they would observe uh, and evaluate, but they would not start antibiotics. In 5%, they would uh, start antibiotics treat empirically and in those babies the risk of sepsis was eight upon 1000 live births. So now the main question is, is it applicable to our settings? Here the maximum incidence in this calculator is four upon 1000. We know that in our setting up to 30 per 1000 live births might have uh, culture positive sepsis. Gestation is only specific for late preterm and term babies. Another thing that we know is GBS is rare in India. We do not have the policy of universal GBS precautions. So the next question is, don't we have our own calculator? Have anybody looked at uh, such a calculator or risk factor based approach in our scenario? The answer is, um, in there is one study from uh, PGI. Uh, this is in preterm babies less than 34 weeks of gestation. So they had included around 600 mother infant diets out of this 14 per thousand libraries. So these were all intramural births, 14 per thousand libraries had um, um, culture positive sepsis. So what they had um, done was a risk factor based approach. So in their multivariate analysis of risk factors, what they found was these six risk factors had a higher um, 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 a probability that the baby might develop early onset sepsis. So the risk factors were birth weight less than 1500 grams, if the baby's gestation was less than 30 weeks, if it was a male sex, um, more than uh, three um, per vaginal examination, mother had not received any intrapartum antibiotics. So this is not for a specific GBS prophylaxis. It was based on the obstetrician providing the mother with antibiotics um, on a case-to-case -case basis and presence of maternal chorioaminitis. So be, based on the odds risk for the uh, odds ratio for the risk of sepsis, they, they had allotted a scoring system. So what they at, at the end, they have um, um, uh, incorporated all the six factors and they have come up with a scoring system. So if the score was a zero to six, the babies can be evaluated and uh, they can just be monitored clinically for 72 hours. If the score was seven or more, we need to start empirical antibiotics. So this is the Fagan's nomogram. So in, if the, in this particular unit, the baseline incidence of sepsis was 14. So this 14 per thousand libraries. This is what I have marked. So based on risk factor approach, so if um, um, the risk factor was um, nine or something, there was a odds of having likelihood ratio was around four. So post test, the, uh, the probability would be from 14, it would increase to, to somewhere around 38. So this is a higher incidence of sepsis, we would definitely start antibiotics. But if the risk was low, um, so say the score was um, three or four, the likelihood of uh, likelihood ratio was low. So the automatically our risk of sepsis now um, becomes three per thousand live births. So this risk factor based approach based on maternal risk factors and the newborn um, birth uh, condition can be used to, to uh, decide uh, whether we need to evaluate infants or treat infants. So some of these risk factors like maternal fever, uh, the rupture of membrane and the baby factors would be available for babies who deliver in hospital. What about babies who come to the, uh, or whom we meet in the community or mothers take these babies to a primary with certain symptoms. How do we evaluate these babies? So from the community, it is known that out of the entire population which presents, 
up to nine um, percent uh, can have possible um, serious bacterial infection, and another nine percent can have milder illness. How do we identify these babies in the community where often uh, the history or the investigations are not available? So we have a data from the young infant study which said that if you have seven, uh, they have said that uh, there are important um, uh, clinical signs or symptoms. If one among these seven clinical signs or symptoms are present in the baby, then there is a high risk for serious, uh, possible serious bacterial infection. The sensitivity was 85% and specificity was 75%. So, and this is, this was true for babies between uh, zero to six days old and those in the young infants also between uh, seven to 59 days old. So what are these seven signs or symptoms? History of difficulty in feeding, history of convulsion, movement only when stimulated, tachypnea, respiratory rate defined as more than 60 per minute, severe chest in drawing and hypo or hyperthermia. So in the community setup, if you happen to see a baby with any one of these clinical signs or symptoms, that baby needs to be referred to a higher center. That baby has a higher risk for possible serious bacterial infection. So PSBI, what we call in the community, we are trying to diagnose bacterial uh, septicemia, pneumonia, and meningitis. Because these clinical signs are uh, not very specific, we may tend to overdiagnose or we might tend to include certain other uh, illnesses also. As you see in this picture, we are concerned about this, but because of the non-specific nature of the signs or symptoms that we use, we might still cover a little more of the, but missing babies would be dangerous. So, um, so this is what the PSBI would mean. So um, to sum up, clinical diagnosis is very important. Uh, you can try to stratify based on clinical diagnosis as babies who are definitely ill, asymptomatic, or equivocal findings. At, when babies are born in hospital, try to factor in the maternal risk factors also when you evaluate a baby for early onset sepsis. If you meet a baby in the community, Try to think about the seven clinical signs or symptoms. Any one of these signs would indicate a possible serious bacterial infection. That baby needs to be referred to a healthcare facility. Okay. So now the next question is the offense in blood culture. We know that blood cultures are very important and uh, uh, they are the gold standard for diagnosis of sepsis. But what we often see is they are often reported sterile or negative. So how do I believe these blood cultures? Are they really useful? Should I keep sending them? So this is what we'll try to answer. So when we um, um, worry about a negativity of blood culture, we should remember that there are a number of factors which are very important that determine the positivity of blood culture. So these are very important factors like the volume of blood that we send, the ratio between the blood and the culture media, what skin preparation techniques are we using, are we sending the blood cultures before we take the uh, we, before we give the first dose of antibiotic? And uh, these are not very important, but uh, might be useful in the adult scenario, like the number of cultures taken or whether uh, you are uh, no uh, you need to send an anaerobic culture or not. But these are the ones which are more specific uh, or useful for neonates. So. We know that in two thirds of babies, low level bacteremia is very common, which means that uh, per ml of blood, the colony count can be as less as uh, like 10 colony forming unit per ml or below. And up to 40% can have just one colony forming unit per ml. So in low level bacteremia, uh, it is very important to, to get a growth out of this uh, low level bacteremia. It's very important that the minimum volume of blood that we send in blood culture bottle should be at least one ml. The, the, ratio, the ratio between the blood and the culture media. So your optimal ratio is one is to 10. In the blood, um, there are a number of other factors which prevent bacterial growth. We heard from the previous lecture that you have complement phagocytic cells, the lysozymes, which will prevent bacterial growth. In the blood culture uh, bottle, we have factors which will 
facilitate the bacterial growth. One is it provides dilution and there is a culture media and then there are a number of resins which will try to bind the antibiotics and uh, favor the bacterial growth. So for an optimal growth, uh, the ratio between the blood and the culture media should be maintained between 1 is to 10. Third, we should try to decrease the contaminants. Contaminants are usually the, the, uh, the skin, um, epidermis, staph, epidermidis, those are the organisms, the skin commensals, these are the important contaminants. So to prevent that, we should prepare the media, that, that prepare the skin. So how can we prepare that? Use an antiseptic, use sterile or aseptic precautions in collecting the blood culture alcoholic chlorhexidine, tincture iodine, isopropyl alcohol, or a combination of this. But most importantly, they can't be killed immediately. So it's very important that the uh, antiseptic that we use dries and takes time to action. So wait for the antiseptic to dry before you take. Uh, the site of culture is also important. So ideally, a peripheral venous venipuncture is recommended to collect the culture. Do not collect from an indwelling uh, cannula um, UAC, UVCs, um, um, they are also prone for contamination. So if when you are inserting it for the first time, you might be able to take it, but do not take from any indwelling cannula or a pick line. Timing of culture is important. So ideally, before the first dose of antibiotic, blood culture has to be taken. Very often we face this uh, in our setting that um, after we take the blood culture, by the time we get the result and act on it, it is very delayed. So in uh, low middle income, so this might be the process in a high income setting, uh, the blood culture, everything is into uh, automated, they get the result by around 24 hours and the turnaround time, that is the point that the clinician sends the culture and he receives the culture report and he acts on it. So this is a turnaround time. It's very fast in high income countries as compared to a low in middle income countries. We very often depend upon the manual methods and the turnaround time is very often delayed. So uh, talking about some advances in this, this has been the classical traditional method. We grow, uh, um, we incubate uh, in the culture bottles and then uh, we try to uh, do subcultures and wait for the bacterial growth. Now automatic uh, methods are available, which will try to detect the carbon dioxide uh, emanated by the growth of the bacteria. So once the carbon dioxide is detected using a uh, calorimetric method or other fluoroscopic methods, the blood culture bottle will be packed. There would be a signal given to the microbiologist that some growth is happening in this particular culture bottle. So once that flagging is identified, then they can make what is called as a bacterial pellet that can be obtained from these culture bottles. And uh, using this, various techniques can be done. One advance is uh, the identification of the bacteria. So this will flag that something is growing. Now we need to identify the bacteria. We can use what is um, called as the MALDI-TOF. This is an advancement in the diagnosis of the identification of bacteria. So MALDI-TOF uh, uh, stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization Time of Light spectro Spectrometry. That is what MALDI-TOF stands for. That can help in identification. And using this uh, bacterial pellet, we can obtain a gram, gram stain that can be obtained very quickly. This by with this we can identify the bacterial uh, organism. We can also perform an antimicrobial sensitivity testing very quickly, and uh, with certain PCRs we can also see, see whether that uh, MRSA uh, the species staph species is MRSA or not. So now we can quickly do all these with the advanced automated technique. So previously in the pre era this is what. Uh, used to happen, we would see using gram stain, whether the bacteria are identified in clusters or they are in groups, whether they are gram positive, gram negative, and then the dilution method for sensitivity. So in the post uh, maldi era, they have certain signatures. These bacteria have signatures. This is called as peptide mass fingerprint method. So with the available um, uh, database, this can be compared and the bacteria can be identified very quickly. The other uh, advance has been with the antimicrobial sensitivity reporting. This uh, is the disk diffusion method. We can also do the tube dilution technique for 
antimicrobial sensitivity but this is an advancement so what is uh, this is an automated vitec these are disposable we need to feed in the uh, the culture that uh, 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 from the bottle where uh, we had identified the flagging the um, uh, antibiotics are distributed in various dilutions so um, once this is fed here uh, we will get the report immediately so how does this um, growth it tracks the growth of the uh, organism in those wells and can also detect the minimal inhibitory concentration for a particular antibiotic for that particular bug that we have detected so this is um, um, uh, at jitmar we have been having this automated uh, blood culture uh, methods so this is a report that we usually get um, these are the data that we provide we clinicians provide the microbiologist including the site of uh, uh, the the sample which we have taken and they provide us the time to positivity so this is the time that the bottle was flagged by the machine so in this case acinetobacter baumani was detected time to positivity was 58.7 hours sometimes we have time to positivity as early as 4 hours 5 hours so this is very important because uh, generally when there is a grow it is usually detected within 12 to 24 hours so in majority 90% would have a bacterial growth within 12 uh, 24 hours so if it is very delayed so if you are having a delayed growth beyond 72 hours then it might be a contaminant or uh, fastidious organism you need to look at, into it so we also get the uh, uh, ast pattern and the sensitivity and the um, um, resistance pattern reported so one another advantage is that we get what is called as the mic guiding table so what does this mean usually if this is the um, susceptibility break point which means that this the for this bug uh, they would be if um, th these are the usual my antimicrobial concentration for which this particular bug would be susceptible so for uh, for the isolate that we have obtained for this particular organism um, we know that cotrimoxazole sifaperazole minocyclin and meropenem so those are the uh, sensitive antimicrobials for this particular bug so with this mic guiding table we can now choose which antibiotic among these that we can determine so what we call is therapeutic index we look how far away is this particular mic away from the susceptibility break point so here 2 divided by 0.5 which is 4 similarly 4 by 1 four so these two drugs have the same therapeutic index but these are not directly comparable because their mics are not comparable but among these two drugs i can now choose an antibiotic for uh, treating this baby i know that minocycline tetracycline is not generally recommended meropenem is might be a better it can cross the blood brain barrier treat meningitis better so with this mic guiding table clinicians are more informed about the uh, antimicrobial that they can choose for a treating a particular organism so when we send blood culture there are certain quality indicators that as a unit that we can try to track down so these are the proportion of blood cultures which show a pathogen or a culture positivity rate in high income countries it is usually to the tune of 5 to 12% but in um, low middle income countries uh, because the basic rates of sepsis itself is high we can get up to 15 to 30% so if your culture positivity rate is 50 60% then it probably means that you are not suspecting sepsis or you are not sending cultures um, as a um, um, as a unit culture so you need to uh, send cultures for for all babies whom you suspect sepsis the other thing is um, um, the total number of blood cultures taken per 1000 patient days missed opportunities number of cases where you fail to take a culture before starting antibiotics the contaminant rates uh, the volume of bl um, blood per bottle should be at least 80% of recommended the needle to incubator time very often we see that the blood culture is taken and it is kept in one corner until the uh, the um, um, 
the assistant or the um, um, the worker comes to take it to the microbiology lab so this is very important as soon as the culture is taken if it is sent to the incubator uh, the needle to incubator time that is very important um, also we can follow the time to positivity turnaround time the moment we send culture until we get the report that is called as a turnaround time and the quality of the antimicrobial sensitivity reporting so these are certain uh, points that we can be used to track the blood culture uh, so to summarize blood cultures are very important uh, uh, all unit we should develop the habit of uh, or uh, the culture of sending blood cultures for all uh, cases where we suspect uh, if you pay attention to the method that you take, uh, the method of uh, taking blood cultures, then uh, it will improve your yield. So now let's come to the role of a sepsis screen, whether it is, uh, should we be sending these and what role it has. So um, if you remember the previous lecture, uh, we saw that many of the leukocytes as well as the neutrophils they do, do not go and reach the site of infection very well the uh, the problems with the neonatal uh, immunity so that is uh, the sepsis screen is basically made of those components so um, screen is a composite uh, thing so it has various components importantly total leukocyte count if it is less than 5000 the absolute neutrophil count we have munro and the mosinos chart uh, to say whether there is neutropenia, the immature to total leukocyte count if it is more than 0.2, micro ESR, very often we are now not doing the micro ESR, the C-reactive protein. So taken together, if two or more screen components are positive, then we call it as a screen positive and, uh, and it has a sensitivity which is uh, between 93%, specificity 83%, but most important is positive predictor value. So positive predictor value is very, very poor, which means that if you have a positive sepsis screen, then the reliability that the baby will have sepsis is very poor. On the other hand, it has a very high negative predictor value, which means that if the screen is negative, then you can be very sure that it may not be sepsis. So these are the charts that can be used. As you can see, there is a change with the age of the baby. So that is why we use the charts to say whether there is um, uh, neutropenia or not. Uh, people have developed a scoring system. They have also looked at the peripheral smear to see whether there are toxic granules and the band forms uh, and the cytoplasmic vacuoles. So in this uh, um, scoring system, I'll just highlight a few things, few important things. So when your components of the score, as your score increases, sensitivity becomes low and specificity increases. Second, positive predictive value is uniformly low, which means that, as we discussed earlier, you can't be sure. If the screen is positive, it does not always mean infection. However, negative predictive value is consistently higher. For early onset sepsis, these screens do not perform very well. However, they can perform a little bit better in late onset sepsis. So to sum up, uh, screens, sepsis screens have good negative predictive value. If you take two sepsis screens 24 hours apart and if they are negative, then you can use it to rule out sepsis. Ideally, the first screen has to be done when the baby is between 12 to 18 hours uh, of age because if you take a screen very early, the changes or the, the response to neutrophils may not be adequate. Individual screen components do not have any meaning. You have to take the composite uh, screen component. They have a lesser role in early onset sepsis compared to late onset sepsis. So the crux is if the baby is symptomatic and if you're strongly suspecting sepsis, don't rely on your sepsis screen. Go ahead, take blood culture and start antibiotics and trust that blood culture that comes out. So what is the specific role of CRP? We often send CRP and give more importance to CRP. So it is the most studied biomarker. We said we saw that these are primarily synthesized from the hepatocytes and the interleukins and um, um, interleukins they, from the bacteria, they help a role in production of the uh, CRP. 
um, of the various methods that can be used uh, to measure CRP, this particular kit comes in handy. This is a qualitative measurement, which is uh, by latex agglutination we often have in our units. So it is either CRP positive or negative, and then a particular cutoff is used, often six milligram per deciliter. So the cost is for a latex test is very cheap, 45 to 50 rupees. When you have a quantitative estimation, it can be higher. So what are the fallacies with CRP? CRP can also increase naturally with the, with the age of the baby and then it would come down. Values can rise as high as 20 milligrams per liter. And um, even the process of labor, like it is higher after a normal delivery and emergency section compared to an elective section. And the sensitivity um, also no, is a bit medium. So um, there is a Cochrane meta-analysis looking at the value of C-reactor protein in late onset sepsis. Um, uh, so the sensitivity was poor, 0.69. Specificity was higher, 0.8. And these are the positive and the negative likelihood ratio. The CRP thresholds used in this was uh, 5 to 10 milligrams per liter. So what does this mean? CRP was, is not sufficiently accurate to decide whether you can treat the baby with antibiotics or not. What is in So if you have a hypothetical cohort of 1,000 whom you do CRP and your prevalence of sepsis is around 20%, you are likely to miss 72 babies if you rely on CRP and around 200 babies are likely to be falsely treated for sepsis. As the sepsis incidence goes up, the likelihood that you will miss more babies is higher and uh, a similar number would be falsely treated. So you cannot rely on a single CRP measurement which you do to decide whether baby has sepsis or not. But if you do serial CRPs, at least two, C two serial CRPs separated by 24 hour interval, then you can be more confident to rule out sepsis. Is procalcitonin better? So this is the production of procalcitonin. Also, although the thyroid is a principal uh, producer, parafollicular C cells, there are other organs which from which procalcitonin can be produced. So uh, these inflammatory markers will drive uh, towards procalcitonin rather than the calcitonin production. Again, based on the aging hours, it also follows a trend. So you will have to see the age specific value to see whether the value is higher or not. Okay, so compared to CRP, it rises fast and has a higher peak. And in the studies, it was the sensitivity and specificity was better compared to CRP. So it appears that procalcitonin might perform better compared to CRP. These are the measurement techniques that we use to uh, measure uh, the procalcitonin and the cost is higher. It is at least 10 times uh, higher uh, compared to CRP. So how accurate is uh, procalcitonin? Accuracy is better compared to CRP. So if the, for a late onset sepsis, if the baseline risk is around 20%, uh, around only 42 cases are likely to be missed and uh, uh, around 300 cases might be overtreated. And if the baseline risk is around 40%, the significant uh, cases might still be missed. So here comes in your clinical judgment in treating the baby. So we saw the various uh, advantages compared to CRP. One thing is it's less influenced by viral infection. The values can correlate with severity of infection and it can be done with small blood volumes. So definitely the answer is when compared to CRP, procalcitonin is better. What about molecular diagnostic? So this, this is where the molecular diagnostics come into picture because after your clinical signs or symptoms, there is uh, no these inflammatory biomarkers might take little time to arise. But when you look at the PCR of the uh, bacteria, and certain other biomarkers, these might, the interleukins, TNF alpha, they rise very early. So that is where the molecular diagnostics come into picture. So they, um, um, so you, they do not specify, they do not provide information on which bacteria is it or the antimicrobial susceptibility. So for here, you'll have to rely certainly on the blood culture. 
So there are two methods for the PCR identification. One is the broad range, which will detect the 16 years rRNA, which is uniformly, which is a conserved moiety across all bacteria. But when you want to identify the species or the type of organism, then you have to use specific. So sensitivity and specificity are always higher compared to uh, uh, the, uh, the general blood culture techniques. So, but the, the, the authors of this Cochrane review say that these are not sufficiently sensitive or specific to replace blood culture methods. So, we uh, still rely on the blood culture method. So, the final answer is so with all this knowledge in a resource limited setting, which is the best way to go. So, these are the summary points. Assessment of maternal risk factors for early onset sepsis is very crucial. Clinical examination is very, very important. Nothing can replace clinical examination or the index of suspicion. Uh, sepsis screen has less value in early onset sepsis. Two sepsis screens done 12 or 24 hours apart or serial sepsis screens can rule out sepsis. CRP has less sensitivity uh, to triage babies to decide whether you need to treat or not. But again, if you have serial CRPs, then that is a value. Procalcitonin performs better. Molecular diagnostic methods are upcoming, but they cannot replace blood culture. So the final answer here, if you want to diagnose or you know with confidence, the hero is always the blood culture. But we need to improve the uh, output or the reliability of blood culture. You need to have the culture of sending blood cultures before any antibiotic. Make sure that the blood culture is sent. We are providing such an enriched media for the growth of bacteria. So trust the blood culture. So act always based on the blood culture and try to remove um, contamination in the blood culture by ensuring that uh, we follow proper precautions in um, taking the blood culture. This would avoid unnecessary use of antibiotics. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, patient listening and thanks again uh, the IAP uh, TCB branch for providing me with this opportunity. We can take questions, sir. So thank you, Sindhu, for uh, uh, for uh, highlighting and also for uh, summarizing the diagnosis of sepsis in a very lucid manner. And I see that a lot of questions now coming up. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, before uh, we take the questions, you did highlight uh, that uh, clinical scoring or clinical risk factors would play a major role in the diagnosis of sepsis. Because clinically, if you think of sepsis, then you better start antibiotics and do a culture. But when you are in doubt, then you do a screen. And if your screen is negative, then you think of it is not infection. You look for other causes. When you are in doubt, if screen is positive, it still may not be infection. Then you need to work up further. Um, that is the message which you are given. And uh, please concentrate on doing blood cultures because uh, uh, unless you do blood cultures, you don't know what microbes are sitting there and how do you treat an infection and how long you treat your infections. So rightly highlighted the role of blood culture and also now currently the availability of uh, fast blood cultures and auto automation of uh, both culture positivity as well as sensitivity pattern. You did uh, underplay the role of CRP, procalcitonin and interleukins and I'm sure that that should be the way. We should not work, sepsis is not CRP and sepsis is more of, uh, uh, more of uh, clinical sense and uh, blood cultures and, uh, and not really procalcitonin or uh, uh, interleukins or uh, uh, whatever other things. So, so there are certain questions here. Please, uh, maybe you can answer one by one. Uh, scoring for early onset sepsis in hospitals at community levels, we rely on clinical picture. I think you have really highlighted the score of uh, early onset sepsis using the uh, likelihood ratios and also for late onset sepsis, you told about the seven signs which we should looking for. Um, what is a nomogram? It is not a nomogram. It is just uh, the likelihood ratios which she has shown. Um, there should be red flags which can be identified even by healthcare worker. I think she has rightly highlighted the red flags for the healthcare workers, mainly for late onset sepsis. Are there any separate bacteria culture bottles for neonates or the, are, are the same in pediatric patients? Uh, the, the pediatric ones uh, and the neonatal ones, they are the same. Uh, in neonates, we need to send at least one ml uh, Beyond 36 right. months, we can send 2 ml, but uh, the, the bottles are the same. Okay. What is the role of CD64 and interleukin-6? 
um, I personally have no, no experience with using these. These are emerging technologies. They have to be used in conjunction if it is available. One thing is they are very costly, not available. There might be other conditions which can increase CD64. So they can't be relied upon. So there is one, uh, one individualized question where there is a late preterm or a term baby with respect to distress, which lasts for more than six hours, but there is no risk factor screen and CRP is negative. Sepsis screen is negative, X-ray is normal. So do we continue think it is infection or something else? Nothing is, uh, if the baby is stable and if baby is improving, I would suggest continue to monitor the baby. Uh, if there is worsening in the next six hours or 12 hours, worsening symptoms, then you would think, should think of sepsis. I think uh, that baby needs more close observation rather than thinking of infection. Uh, if clinical signs or if x-ray suggests to, one could send a culture and start antibiotics. But otherwise, if everything is normal, just keep wait and watch and the baby may improve or look for other conditions like a PDA or a PPH and could be the reason for persistent respiratory distress. How do you differentiate contaminant for pathogen, especially using the molecular methods? So with, uh... How do differentiate contaminant from a pathogen? Uh, blood culture, we can try to differentiate. One is the time to positivity. Contaminants usually grow later. Second is the type of organisms. If you are growing staph epidermidis and the baby is not symptomatic, then it is more likely to be a contaminant. With molecular methods, we cannot really differentiate because it is looking for the 16 years RRNA. So even a dead bacteria with this uh, thing, you can still detect that particular, uh, it can you know, flag, be positive with molecular methods. Yeah, I think there is one um, question that culture positivity is not practical though gold standard. Do you agree with that? I don't not know. Practical, uh, culture, post culture uh, blood culture is not practical? No, no. For all cases. Yeah. I think we have to get, get away from this myth that blood culture is not possible. It is doable, simple, and it can be done anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. I think we need to move from uh, uh, CRPs and pro students and move towards cultures for diagnosing infection. I think we need to break this myth that blood culture is difficult. And uh, doing the correct way and correct technique will give us a lot of uh, results from the blood culture. Uh, for, for doing a wonderful presentation and also breaking a lot of myths on the diagnosis of sepsis. Although we said advanced, but advanced come from the basics. The foundation, if it's strong, the advanced doesn't matter. And you did highlight how do we improve the basic techniques of identifying uh, neonatal infections. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we move on to the next part of this uh, symposium. We're already late by an hour, half an hour or 40 minutes. But uh, I think uh, the organizers would allow us that time. For the next uh, presentation, I would request uh, Venkat Vardeli. Uh, Venkat, you are here. He is going to speak on supportive care and management of neonatal sepsis. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you share your screen, uh, Venkat? So Venkat, yes, again, is a, a very good and uh, uh, very good uh, neonatologist. and. Uh, he is a budding neonatologist, he's just finished his uh, neonatology DM, DNB, and he is now a consultant neonatology at Kamnani Hospital, Hospital LB Nagar. Uh, he is uh, uh, known for his knowledge, skills, and also his presentations are excellent. And uh, hopefully, we will learn much more from Venkat on the supportive care and adjunctive therapy of neonatal sepsis. Over to you, Venkat. Thank you, you sir. See here we can hear you and we can see your slides please go ahead yes sir. thank you sir thank you very much uh, for giving the opportunity sir and uh, good morning everyone uh, uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity dr baska sir and cnad sir and dr venkat sir and uh, today uh, we are discussing about the neonatal sepsis the supportive care and the adjuvant therapy very important components of the uh, neonatal sepsis management and first we will deal with the uh, su supportive care uh, in the NICU, uh, when, whenever there is a complication, the inadequate provision of 
therapy at the same time over jealous treatment or over burden of the therapy both increases the complication it is a balance of uh, uh, treatment uh, and it is giving the it is uh, mainly the key is providing optimal provision to give a better results and decreasing the complications in the nico so the supportive care is very key uh, very important uh, to give optimal care and first uh, in a sepsis baby if the providing adequate perfusion maintaining adequate perfusion is very important septic shock uh, encompasses multiple forms of the shock it is not just one uh, form of the shock there will be hypovolemia because of the third spacing of fluids into the extracellular and interstitial space and uh, there will be decreased afterload uh, and distributive shock can be there and uh, cardiogenic shock there is a endotoxins uh, causing myocardial dysfunction Uh, lead to these all three types of shock, which uh, uh, makes very difficult in managing a septic shock. And often in the neonates and the preterm babies, uh, this neonatal sepsis is already uh, always uh, most of the times complicated by other conditions like uh, pulmonary hypertension, hypovolemia, asphyxia, and PDA. So it is uh, slightly difficult to understand uh, septic shock just by clinical parameters. And the common shock definition, uh, which we use uh, in the clinical scenario. Uh, often used in a reported uh, definition uh, two of the out of these six criteria are there we label it as a shock uh, heart rate more than 180 per minute and decreasing in the blood pressure map less than 30 or map less than 50 centel for the gestational age or systolic bp less than 2 standard for the age and alguria less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for uh, preceding last 6 hours and capillary relief time prolonged uh, more than 3 seconds and central to peripheral co- co- temperature difference more than 3 degrees and Blood gas showing metabolic age doses with a base excess more than five and lactate more than two times upper normal value. So this uh, parameter helps uh, to identify the shock, and uh, the parameter circulatory parameters with which we can monitor is uh, to identify the intravascular volume, urine output, blood pressure, cardiac cha- on on functional echocardiogram chamber volumes, and vena cava, uh, IVC collapsibility and distensibility will be uh, helpful in assessing the intravascular volume, and the cardiac function. will be uh, can be assessed by blood pressure urine output and uh, cardiac output on the functional echo ejection fraction fractional shortening and myocardial performance index mpi tissue doppler and deformation parameters these these will help in identifying the uh, cardiac function and vasomotor regulation like system vascular resistance uh, can be assessed by skin perfusion pulse volume blood pressure and cardiac output systemic blood flow can be assessed by skin perfusion svc flows and uh, cardiac output urine output and nirs uh, also can be helpful this lr and metabolism usually uh, uh, better uh, assessed by blood lactate and base excess and uh, clinically we we have many parameters as we discussed previously to define the shock but uh, to understand the shock functional echo is a key and uh, from the recent study we understood on 37 infants Uh, where almost 86 percent of the babies who had sepsis, the clinical based on the clinical and uh, evaluation and clinical course over the period, the ideal job of the shock was identified as hypovolemia in 13 percent patients and cardiogenic shock in 8 percent patient and mixed shock in 78 percent patient. But when we do functional echo, uh, we un- understood that hypovolemia is in just 8 percent and cardiogenic uh, shock is in 21 percent, slightly higher. Yes, sir. And mixed shock and distributed shock are uh, rest of the remaining are there. So there is a to understand just a shock by clinically there will be difference in management of uh, and it will uh, functional echo will be more helpful. So these parameters, these pathophysiological parameters are overlapping in units. So functional echo helps for the better understanding and management of the shock. And when we see the parameters, important parameters, the cardiac output is uh, the uh, product of stroke volume and heart rate. The stroke volume is the product of uh, preload and uh, uh, venous compliance and uh, blood volume. And the system vascular resistance gives the uh, cardiac output. Heart rate and system vascular resistance give you the cardiac output. So these are the important parameters which we need to uh, assess in every baby uh, to define uh, to understand the shock. So these will be assessed in the uh, functional echocardiography. The hypovolemia will be assessed by IVC collapsibility index of more than 50%, and IVC size of less than 2.1 mm. And cardiogenic uh, uh, contractility will be assessed by ejection fraction less than 50% in the neonates, and uh, some authors take it less than 65%. And LV output or RV output less than 130 mL per kg per minute, and 
Uh, for the mixed shock, we can uh, take the both criteria fulfilled and distributed shock in the absence of hypovolemia and cardiogenic features, they will, uh, on the echocardiography, it is taken as distributed shock. The other parameters which will be uh, taken for the contractility and cardiac performance is from uh, fractional shortening is one of, one of the important parameters. In the units, especially in the units, fractional shortening is preferred compared to the Ejection fraction because uh, the uh, multiplying error will be de decreased by the fractional shortening. And uh, uh, SVC flows gives the uh, uh, blood uh, cardiac output and uh, the blood flows to the upper part of the body and to the brain, it will give correct picture. And the fluid overload can be uh, assessed by LA by left atrium by aortic uh, ratio, root ratio, and um, the EYA ratio on the mitral valve and isovolumic relaxation time uh, of the uh, left ventricle. And uh, diastolic function can be assessed by E by ratio, IVRT, and uh, transhalinar planar, uh, plane systolic excursion can be assessed. And the right ventricular performance can be, systolic performance can be assessed by tricuspid degustation, and uh, pulmonary hypertension can be assessed by tricuspid degustation and pul uh, uh, pulmonary artery axillary time. And the shunt directions always give the clue of uh, mixing of the blood and uh, direct functioning of the both ventricles and uh, uh, heart, complete heart. When we see the vasopressor synotropes, these are the mechanism of actions. Dopamine especially uh, acts more than four microgram per kg per minute, acts on the beta-1 receptors and uh, uh, alpha-1 receptors and uh, beta-2 receptors also. Dopamine mainly acts on the beta-1 receptors uh, uh, and uh, uh, as the dose increases, the beta-2 action also will be increased. Vasodilator, beta-2 mediated vasodilatation also will be increased and alpha, uh, less of alpha-1 action with the do, uh, dopamine. And epinephrine acts on all the uh, beta-1, alpha-1, and beta-2 receptors. And milrinone is acts uh, beta-1-like action, like uh, because of the uh, CAMP mechanism, uh, phosphodiesterase is inhibition, phosphodiesterase 3 inhibition. It gives the uh, beta-1-like action and a beta-2-like action. Uh, and norepinephrine gives mainly acts on the alpha-1 and beta-1. It doesn't act, cause vasodilatation, beta-2. It doesn't act on the um, beta-2 much. And uh, vasopressin, it gives the alpha-1 like action because of the uh, V1 receptor me mechanism. These are the uh, uh, understanding inotropic actions and receptors and the dose dependent, mainly the dose dependent effects of these inotropes are very, very important. And when we see in the clinical scenario, the uh, stroke volume will be increased uh, much uh, by uh, this uh, dobutamine will, uh, uh, will be increasing stroke volume and epinephrine will increase the stroke volume more compared to the dopamine and norepinephrine. And uh, uh, now dopamine increases the system of vascular resistance and it increases more in the pulmonary vascular resistance. That's why uh, it should be used cautiously in the uh, pulmonary hypertension. And norepinephrine mainly acts on the system of vascular resistance. It increases the system of vascular resistance, some uh, effect on the uh, stroke volume also. And vasopressin is the highest uh, uh, vasoconstrictor with a uh, good system of vascular increasing in the system of vascular resistance. And dopamine uh, acts on the system, improves the stroke volume, uh, uh, again, uh, causes the beta 2 uh, action with the vasodilatation, decreasing the SVR also if possible. And mildenone mainly uh, decreasing in the SVR with the vasodilatation and stroke volume will be there. And uh, epinephrine acts on all the three receptors, mainly with the stroke volume. So which uh, inotrope uh, gives which uh, 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 physiological uh, mechanism of action is very important to know uh, uh, to uh, to imply in the clinical scenario. So these are the dose dependent effects of the inotropes which we can uh, uh, see in, uh, uh, and uh, in the uh, shock mainly the first component comes with the fluid resuscitation. If there is any hypovolemia suspected hypovolemia or any uh, uh, like IVC collapse, unfunctional echo IVC collapsibility is there and clinical uh, judgment is uh, 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 gives the hypovolemia, we can go ahead with the fluid resuscitation. In the septic shock, first line of the uh, treatment most of the times is uh, hypovolemia. And uh, next line, with, if, if there is no improvement with the uh, fluid resuscitation, uh, the next line comes with the inotrope. So, uh, there is no, as we see here, there is no clinical uh, algorithm uh, as such uh, to uh, go every in a case. It depends on the case based. Uh, Doctor Venkat, your PPT is not visible. Uh, it is shared, ma'am. Visible, ma'am. Yes. Maybe it is visible. Go ahead, Venkat. Yes, yes sir. Okay, uh, sorry. The clinical management of the sepsis, uh, septic shock depends on the baby to baby, it varies and it depends on the pathophysiological mechanism, assessment of the afterload and preload and then contractility. 
and uh, 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 it is there is no uh, dedicated algorithm for to manage all the babies uh, uh, together so the therapeutic decision making is a multimodal hemodynamic assessment and uh, understanding the pathophysiology of the disease in the particular baby with other uh, comorbidities is very important to decide on which inotropy to be used uh, we as we saw already the uh, inotropes and their mechanism of actions uh, we can choose the ideal uh, inotrope based on the clinical scenario and these are the uh, american college of critical care medicine consensus guidelines to uh, manage the shock in term infants and preterm infants so there is a different uh, set of uh, uh, in um, recommendations for the preterm infants also there uh, but to uh, see this uh, when we see these uh, uh, recommendations uh, first initial resuscitation with uh, 10 ml per kg of uh, isotonic cellular colloid up to 60 ml per kg uh, is recommended but this in the normal clinical scenario we usually don't practice up to 60 ml per kg in the neonates and for every patient uh, to start with the dopamine even if there is any uh, uh, like warm shock is there uh, uh, it is it may not be uh, appropriate in the case scenario so these are the these are the guidelines these are the guidelines are uh, slightly uh, questionable and in the practic practical scenario uh, slightly uh, uh, variability may be there so uh, in the in the simple scenario to understand that even though we every uh, baby's uh, uh, management of the shock fluid resuscitation and anotropic choice based on that their own pathophysiological mechanism the uh, bro broadly we can choose uh, for the warm shock if there is a vasodilatation capillary weakening uh, is there if the clinical assessment is more of warm shock uh, then we can give a volume and uh, we can go with the norepinephrine uh, norepinephrine and dopamine and if there is any fluid catecholamine resistance shock is there then we can go with the hydrocortisone if there is a cold shock with the vasoconstriction then we can go with the uh, fluid replacement and then uh, going with the uh, dobutamine or milirubin will may be the appropriate choice depending on the blood pressure so this is a broad a, uh, 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 we can approach like this, but every baby is uh, different uh, to approach it uh, with the pathophysiology. And uh, coming to the hydrocortisone, uh, preterms usually we know as uh, that there is relative adrenal insufficiency in the preterms. But uh, these uh, corticosteroids, uh, uh, although these are effective in improving the blood pressure in hypotensive infants, it is not the first line of recommend uh, treatment. Hydrocortisone should be always recommended only in the refractory hypotension cases. It's not, it should not be as a first line. And uh, the hemodynamic goals and therapeutic endpoints after the uh, septic shock management is uh, like maintaining normal heart rate, blood pressure, and saturation in the normal range for the uh, gestational age, and warm extremities, good volume and peripheral pulses, and uh, uh, CRT less than or equal to two seconds, and uh, normal urine output with more than one ml per kg per hour. And less than five percent of the difference between the preductal and postductal saturations, and on the functional echo, which will be guided in some places where it is available, the SVC flows with greater than 40 ml per kg per minute, and cardiac output more than three uh, li uh, uh, liters per minute per meter square, and uh, absence of echocardiography evidence on pul of pulmonary hypertension. These are the parameters uh, which we can uh, 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 which we can see the hemodynamic as the therapeutic endpoints. And coming to the next uh, uh, supportive care, optimal oxygenation is uh, also is very important. Optimal respiratory support, depending on the status, should be decided either for the shock or pneumonia or uh, associated PPHN or associated ARDS, uh, uh, the complicated ARDS we can choose. It can be just from the oxygen with the controlled uh, FiO2 and CPAP or NAMB or uh, ventilation, depending on the baby's condition, we can uh, choose. Early ventilation usually improves the shock and uh, target saturations in the preterm babies should be 91 to 95 percent. In the term babies, there is uh, conflicting uh, data. Usually in the term babies in, uh, with PPHN, it is recommended from 92 to 96 percent. And uh, always avoid the hyperoxia and uh, avoid the over jealous ventilation, which uh, with high MAP can lead to decreasing in the uh, venous return and can cause uh, further worsening in the shock. And uh, avoid the air leaks and which may complicate the uh, uh, course further. And coming to the nutrition, the very, very important part of the nutrition, the mother's milk is always the best nutrition and it, it gives the cellular and non-cellular components which protects from the infection. At the same time, uh, protects the uh, uh, organs from the bacteria translocation. So internal feeding, as a myth, we know, uh, we think that in the babies with septic shock, uh, their uh, internal feeding should not be given. But it is it is wrong. Enteral feeding is not contraindicated in uh, in neonates with septic shock. After the adequate hemodynamic resuscitation, uh, who no longer require increasing in the uh, vasopressors or uh, who are having uh, who are going to uh, getting 
uh, weaned off from the vasopressors. So interfeeding is uh, withholding interfeed solely just based on the vaso active and inotropic medication is not suggested. If the baby is improving, even if the baby is on inotropes, we can uh, continue. Uh, we can start the interfeeding and improve the uh, uh, improve the nutrition. And supplementation with specialized lipid emulsions and zinc, selenium in se uh, septic shock or other uh, sepsis associated organ dysfunction is not recommended uh, in the in the children and neonates uh, by the Surv uh, surviving sepsis campaign international guidelines. And coming to the other support care, uh, maintaining a normal fluid, normal electrolyte status, and normal glycemia and normal thermia is very important in the units uh, to uh, get a proper outcome. Uh, given the blood products by uh, blood products based on the hemoglobin and platelet content, uh, other coagulation parameters are very vital in preventing the bleeding tendency and uh, further uh, coagulation uh, cascade. And uh, the hemoglobin levels vary on the depending on the gestation age and depending on the respiratory support and depending on uh, uh, depending on the uh, status of the baby. And platelet counts usually now we take as less than twenty five thousand usually is the indication we take now. And um, coagulation parameters as per the normal age and bleeding tendency we can uh, decide on the coagulation uh, to give for, for, uh, fresh progen plasma. And when if the baby has any. Uh, um, uh, because of the any metabolic uh, or uh, because of the infection meningitis, if improving the renal perfusion and uh, if required uh, peritoneal dialysis is as indicated, is also very important. And there is no, uh, no stress cell ulcer prophylaxis should not be given. And this further increases stress ulcer prophylaxis further increases the uh, in chance of infection. So this, this is the support care in the babies uh, briefly uh, to uh, uh, get the better outcomes. Coming to the other part, adjunctive therapy. <clears throat> Despite appropriate antimicrobial therapy, if the uh, immunological process in the baby triggered by the bacteria is getting is activated, then it leads to the multi-organ dysfunction and coagulopathy. So to overcome this measurable, uh, uh, to overcome this uh, immunological cascade, uh, in theoretically, there are some uh, measures which we can implement. Uh, to improve the host defenses and positive interfering with the, this uh, ab abnormal immune responses. So these are all being tested. Some of the uh, molecules are being tested. In that first comes uh, with IVIG. The rational in IVIG is uh, giving IVIG is that only IgG and metal antibody significantly crosses the human placenta. And the placental transfer usually occurs after the 32 uh, weeks of gestation. So most of the preterm babies lack this uh, maternal transfer of IgG antibodies. And after the birth also, effective endogenous IgG synthesis does not begin till some, several, some weeks. And this uh, IgG levels are inversely related to the gestation age and IgG levels in the extreme preterm infants are very, very low and it takes a very long time to take normal levels. So in a baby with sepsis, uh, IgG giving, I theoretically giving IgG improves the opsonization and phagocytosis of the pathogens and it activates the complement and promotes antibody dependent cytotoxicity and improves the neutrophilic chemotaxis. So I, IgM enriched IV is also uh, being tried and theoretically it was shown in the uh, animal studies better opsonization and complement activity. But unfortunately, uh, as if you see the evidence, the, these theoretical benefits are not translated into the practice. So in the Cochrane, updated Cochrane 2020, there are around nine studies with uh, 4,000 4, babies approximately. There was no difference in the uh, mortality during the hospital stay, death or major disability at two years of corrected age and length of uh, hospital stay uh, in the infants treated with IVIG uh, in a proven or suspected infection. So, and again, uh, with IgM enriched IVIG also, for the suspected infection, there was no significant difference in the mortality or hospital stay. And um, so the conclusions they gave was uh, protein administration of IVIG or IgM enriched IVIG to prevent the mortality in infants with suspected or proven or uh, neonatal infection is not recommended. And in this area, because of the large number of babies and large uh, study by uh, any study, there is no further research is recommended. Uh, uh, and then the further research may not be going to change the results in this area. So the large INS trial had almost uh, this contribution for this Cochrane analysis came from this large INS trial is around 3,500 babies are uh, contributed from the INS trial. And uh, other antibodies like anti-staphylococcal immunoglobulins to prevent the staphylococcal infection in the VLBW, uh, like this INH A21 
Alta staff or Aggie Baximov. These three were tried in the uh, randomized control trials, but these were uh, not shown any uh, benefit in these uh, 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 in these studies, and uh, the Pagimaga uh, had borderline uh, better uh, betterment. So the further research uh, were recommended for this uh, Pagi Baximab, and uh, as such, it is not recommended uh, to give any antistaphylococcal antibodies. And coming to the second granulocyte transfusion, uh, especially the rational giving the granulocyte transfusion are neonates, especially preterm, are having quantitative and qualitative deficiencies in the neutrophils. Almost 50% of the preterm with infection will become neutropenic and there is no increase in the neutrophil production after the uh, infection from the bone marrow, bone marrow. So all the neutrophil function, again, the quantity, not only the quantity, the quality of the neutrophil function, every function like pathogen recognition, adherence, chemotaxis, phagocytosis, and intracellular killing, all these are impaired in, uh, in these uh, preterm babies uh, uh, normally and with the infection. So. Uh, giving, uh, as a thought, theoretically, giving granulocyte transfusions may help the babies uh, with these infection. But the uh, results uh, have not come uh, practically into the uh, similar picture. But there were very small studies. All four studies, including only just 79 uh, infants, uh, have given, uh, like, uh, there is no significant difference in the all-cause mortality. But when they, we have seen uh, granulocyte treatment versus IVIG in one study, there was borderline reduction in the all-cause mortality, uh, even though it is not statistically sig significant. Uh, so further research on the granulocyte treatment is recommended. And pulmonary complications with adverse effect with the Burfico transfusions are, uh, are seen in this granulocyte transfusion uh, uh, administration. So the, this uh, granulocyte uh, transfusion further proven or suspected sepsis is uh, further research is recommended. It, right now, it is not recommended for the clinical practice. And coming to the GCSF and GMCSF, these colony stimulating factors uh, or uh, especially pro GCSF promotes the neutrophil proliferation and neutrophil maturation. And granulocyte and monocyte uh, granulocyte uh, colony stimulating factor affects the other cell types also, especially macrophages and uh, eosinophils. These uh, in the animal studies, when the, they saw these myeloid colony stimulating factors improved the innate immune function and resolution of the immune inflammatory conditions because of the sepsis uh, through inhibition of neutrophil apoptosis. But in the uh, uh, practice, uh, a meta-analysis of the Cochrane 2003, both prophylaxis and uh, in neutropenia, uh, it did not show any advantage of the mortality combined together. But when they saw only prophylaxis, uh, it, it, it did not show any mortality increase. But when in the infants with neutropenia, a trial entry, there was significant reduction in the mortality was there. So, and after 2003, uh, there were three, four studies uh, uh, came. Uh, in the first study, uh, CARETO, which, uh, uh, which was a program study, it is a prophylactic uh, transfusion. There was no improvement seen in this study also. But it was when it was given in another two studies by Chaudhary et al. and uh, other study, uh, in the severe neutropenic infants, it was less mortality was there, 10% versus 35%. There was almost 25% uh, absolute reduction was there. In the length of stay was also very less in the, uh, in the, in the infants treated with uh, G GCSF. And another study, uh, this Gatwal et al. also showed improvement in the uh, uh, in improvement. And in summary, GMCSF for prophylaxis of infections in neonates are not useful as such now for the, with the existing evidence. And preterm neonates with moderate or severe neutropenia and systemic infection might benefit from the adjuvant treatment with GCSF or GMCSF. GMCSF. And uh, this was uh, from the review. Uh, they have concluded that it may, it may be useful in the neutropenic infants with the sepsis. And coming to the only immunotherapy uh, network meta-analysis, uh, this network meta-analysis has not shown any improvement uh, with any, uh, any of the modality. So these are the uh, 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 plots which we can see. And uh, there is no improvement with any, uh, any of the comparative uh, uh, study, comparative data. And uh, coming to the next one, pentoxifilin. The rationale in using the pentoxifilin is it is a no, uh, non-specific phosphodiester inhibitor, which has, which also has immunomodulatory properties. This inhibits the production of TLR-mediated inflammatory cytokines, and then the expression of LPS stimulated surface markers like TNF alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-6. In this picture, we can see it acts on the mainly uh, phosphodiester uh, in non-specific phosphodiester inhibition. It acts on all the types of phosphodiester phosphodiesters. And uh, uh, it causes the decreasing in the TLR4 and CD14 and TNF-alpha. These uh, inflammatory cytokines will be reduced. And 
and also it has antioxidant activities like restoring the glutathione levels and mitochondrial viability this uh, pentoxifilin effects uh, are more pronounced in the neonatal immune cells compared to the adults that's why this pentoxifilin is commonly uh, uh, investigated in the neonates compared to the adults so, so th those commonly used in the uh, trials are uh, like uh, 5 mg per kg per hour for 6 hours or for 3 to 6 days and the evidence uh, from the seven rcts uh, in the meta analysis uh, uh, around 440 patients that it reduced the hospital stay and metabolic acidosis but there was no remarkable impact on the mortality in the 2015 cochrane analysis showed there is a decreasing in the mortality but uh, the uh, updated uh, meta analysis did not show any impact on the mortality but after excluding the uh, uh, this agdag at all during the sensitivity analysis due to the uh, heterogeneity the pentoxifilin treatment significantly reduces the mortality uh, compared to the placebo so it is around 50% uh, of relative reduction is there now coming to the another measure, exon transfusion. Uh, this uh, uh, we think that removing the bacteria and their toxins normalizes the plasma coagulation system and increases the host defenses by administration of the components from the exchange blood uh, of the, uh, to the innate immunity. And uh, there are three trials uh, of, on the exon transfusion for the septic shock. Uh, in uh, for the observational study of ten over ten years experience from their center, Pune et al. showed that around septic shock. Uh, in, uh, in the septic shock, exon transfusion showed marked protective effect compared to uh, uh, other, uh, compared to the standard therapy. And uh, Dr. Abhishek Arade et al. Uh, also showed there was a 21% reduction in the mortality, even though this was not statistically, statistically significant, uh, but uh, there was a 21% uh, reduction in the mortality. Another study uh, in, from 1997, Dr. Sadhana S. et al. showed 50% reduction in the mortality in the, uh, by uh, the exon, double volume exon transfusion. But currently, all the uh, um, uh, a systematic reviews doesn't recommend uh, exon transfusion routinely because of the apprehension of complex because of its complex procedure in the very sick septic shock units and uh, even though the study showed it is somewhat safe procedure so exon transfusion is not routinely recommended so most of the in most of the guidelines or institutes practice exon transfusion uh, for the neonates with se severe septic shock which are not responded to the uh, even to the uh, steroids and or uh, with uh, septic shock with sclerema and coming to another uh, measure, zinc. Uh, rationally, uh, zinc deficiency uh, immune, uh, impairs the immune system and increases the risk of infectious, uh, infectious diseases. It improve, increases the oxidative stress and pro-inflammatory state, uh, uh, state. So when we provide uh, this uh, zinc, it will uh, take care of all these uh, complications. And especially this 60% of the zinc accretion to the neonates appears, occurs in the fetus, occurs in the last trimester of the pregnancy. So most of the preterm uh, uh, pre babies are deficient in the zinc and the zinc absorption in the uh, first few weeks of life also very less. So they are deficient in the zinc. Providing zinc the theoretically was uh, thought like it will be helpful in the septic, uh, pre, uh, decreasing the septic uh, infection and immunomodulation, improving the immunomodulation. The metanols in the oral zinc showed reduced mortality rate with the oral zinc supplementation of 3 mg per kg per, uh, uh, per, uh, per dose twice a day uh, for 10 days. But the, this meta-analysis was strongly criticized by uh, because of the three of the four studies included in the uh, meta-analysis were from the uh, overlapping population, but uh, so it was strongly criticized. And in the from the that in which the study by Dr. Banupri et al included in the same study in the same meta analysis, which is a larger study. When we take that study, then there is no effect of zinc supplementation uh, on the sepsis and uh, improvement of the sepsis. So zinc, uh, right now there is no uh, uh, zinc cannot be recommended as a regular uh, uh, medication in the infants with sepsis. And another upcoming uh, molecule, which is uh, being uh, investigated in many of the diseases like HIE also, melatonin. Uh, this is endogenous indolamine. It's a, it has strong accident, antioxidant activity and anti-inflammatory properties through inhibition of the DNA damage and boosting the DNA repair, which is already damaged and activating the antioxidant enzymes and inhibition of the peroxidative enzymes. And it also downloads the pro-inflammatory cytokines. For this mechanism, it is already uh, being investigated in neonatal diseases like HIE. And in sepsis also, there were studies, three small studies uh, with the uh, total population included around 110 uh, uh, is there. In that uh, they tried 20 mg per kg per dose, one or two doses orally, only one dose or two doses in those studies. It has shown, uh, it has been shown that decreased CRP levels with uh, melatonin administration and improved sepsis condition was there. 
So this molecule requires further trials before uh, coming to the uh, practical picture. And other recombinant other agents which are uh, being investigated now are recombinant activated protein C and uh, vitamin A and uh, antimicrobial proteins and peptides and stem cells for the uh, in the in the sepsis and septic shock. And uh, coming to the uh, uh, these are the uh, the pentoxetilin which is updated uh, which is uh, from the, the data from the 2015 Cochrane. It is it has shown that all infants with confirmed or suspe suspected sepsis, all infants with confirmed sepsis. Freedom infants with confirmed or suspect sepsis, pentoxidilin administration has shown all cause mortality to the discharge. But other things, IVIG and, I, um, and uh, IGM enriched IVIG and uh, GACSF, GMCSF, granulocyte transfusion were not shown to be uh, good when we see uh, uh, all the uh, elements in, together. In summary, IVIG as a routine admin, uh, routinely not recommended for the septic uh, sepsis babies. Babies with sepsis and uh, granulose transfusion is also not recommended in the routine practice. And GCSF and GMCSF not routinely recommended for prophylaxis may be helpful in severe neutropenia and uh, further uh, trials also needed in this area. And pentoxifilin is a promising drug and needs further studies. And extend transfusion not routinely recommended but may be useful depending on the clinical scenario. As such, it is not uh, recommended in the routine practice and zinc. Uh, not recommended and melatonin needs further. It's a, uh, again, it's a promising uh, molecule which needs a further studies. And the take home message is that uh, when we see all these molecules, it is always prevention is better than cure, go, uh, than going, uh, subjecting the babies for all these therapies, unnecessary therapies. And appropriate support curve is very important. When in the first slides, we saw that U shaped curve, if it is under uh, treatment or over treatment, both will be harmful for the uh, neonates. And very, very important point is that antibiotic stewardship, when we see the real picture in the uh, scenario, this is one of the uh, early onset sepsis babies uh, blood culture report. So it, uh, it is only sensitive to cholestine. It is not resistant to all the other uh, commonly used or al almost all the antibiotics. So antibiotic stewardship is very, very important, uh, uh, um, as much as important to compare to the prevention of the infections, uh, uh, antibiotic stewardship. So, um, now, with that, now I conclude and uh, I thank you, Dr. Srinivas uh, uh, sir, for giving me the opportunity, uh, my mentor, Dr. Srinivas sir, and thank you very much. Thank you, Venkat, and uh, uh, for uh, making a lucid presentation on the supportive care and adjuvants in the management of sepsis. So he's rightly highlighted the role of uh, respiratory care, circulation, and nutrition. They take the bunch of uh, supportive care and also correcting temperature, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, anemia, polycythemia, and probably role of uh, adjuvants like plasma, HDP. They would have a greater role in the management of sepsis babies rather than any of the adjuvants discussed. As we move more and more into adjuvant therapy, we are finding that uh, uh, although initially they are uh, useful, but over time we find that uh, uh, they do not make much change in the outcome of uh, babies with sepsis like IVAG, GCSF, zinc, exchange transfusion, all these are being tried, but uh, we're not getting a conclusive response from them. So time tested, temperature maintenance, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, anemia, polycythemia, coagulopathy treatment, and then respiratory support either by ventilation early and circulatory support like a very useful clinical guide is told if diastolic low, use vasopressors like dopamine, noradrenaline or vasopressin. But if systole is low, use measures like improving the cardiac output, which could be like first bolus and then uh, go on to have a dobutamine or mildenol. So in warm shock, you will use vasopressors and in cold shock, you will use vasodilators and inotropes. So I think that's the crux of what uh, Venkat has told us. Uh, there are not many questions, Venkat. Uh, um, any role of vitamin D? Oh, vitamin in the neonatal sepsis is uh, uh, not yet uh, proven, sir. No. Don't okay. know exactly so, about the studies also. Sir. Yes. Any role of antifungal prophylaxis? Antifungal prophylaxis uh, is uh, indicated in the uh, <laughs> units where the uh, fungal sepsis in the ELBW infants is more than 10%, it can be used and it, fungal prophylaxis, sir. Otherwise, yeah. it is a routine <laughs> antifungal prophylaxis. <laughs> Yes, sir. In units which have high incidence of fungal sepsis, one can think of them, but not as a routine. Routine practice. 
uh, a newborn with sepsis gets tachycardia, normal CFT, no monitor to check map, echo cannot be done. What to do? With sepsis, uh, tachycardia. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can assess clinically the uh, pulse volume and CFT and other uh, urine output, other things. And uh, uh, based on that, we can decide on the uh, fluid administration, sir, mainly. So I think uh, there, he has already told you that uh, if uh, based on the blood pressure, if systole is uh, problem, use inotropes uh, or in a cold shock, use uh, dobutamine. If you have a warm shock, use uh, vasopressin or norepinephrine and dopamine. Dopamine in the river water. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin are the drugs in warm shock. And in cold shock, dobutamine, mildenone are the drugs of choice. Uh, and think for early ventilation or early respiratory support and correct all the other metabolic problems like uh, hypoglycemia, if there is anemia, correct for it. And many of them may require plasma or uh, um, PRP or HDP for uh, correction of uh, thrombocyte, especially when platelets are less than 30,000. Uh, Dr. Thilak says, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thilak. Okay, so I think we are running short by about 40 minutes, but uh, we promise to finish before one. So, Dr. Baskar, uh, we, will, we will try to finish before one, yes. Um, virus sepsis identification clinically, I don't think we have any specific markers for virus. But yes, the, mark, the presentations are almost similar in newborns, whether it is fungal, bacterial, or virus. There's little difference, but I don't think we have time to discuss that. Uh, 